All right, welcome to chapter 15. This will be the last uh, discussion we're going to have as, as a class as far as going over uh, new material in the uh, textbook. Uh, this is a good chapter to end up. It's very relevant uh, to, uh, unfortunately, all the current things that are going on. Um, I add a few things to it. I, I hope it will make it uh, interesting for you. Uh, what we're going to try to do is explain how microbes are different from other types of uh, organisms. We've already kind of talked about bacterial cell structures you know, of the prokaryotes and, and, and the like. Uh, we're going to talk about how DNA moves from bacteria to other bacteria. How important the normal flora or the natural bacteria that's covering all over us right now as you're sitting there there's bacteria multiplying and growing in all sorts of areas probably areas you don't want to think about but it, it is and I want you to think about probiotics and, and how important it is uh, to get in the habit of thinking about uh, taking uh, these probiotic type of bacteria organisms that help us digest and stay healthy uh, it's it's one of those things that uh, remarkable things happen of course you know I want you to get medical advice and all that but uh, it's a suggestion something to talk about when you see uh, your doctor uh, we're going to talk about unfortunate uh, negative things like antibiotic resistance and how that uh, can affect uh, treatment if you were to get an infection and uh, how we treat those things in light of all this highly resistant bacteria so this is an interesting uh, set of objectives uh, less uh, as much uh, as far as the archaea uh, the, the archaea bacteria are the old uh, what the, the bacteria that actually reduce the environment that we live in I as far as the oxygen and things like that from other methane and, and other types of gases that actually promoted life so I guess it's a living organism or a series of them over billions of years that actually did change the uh, environment or the um, uh, the uh, climate uh, essentially uh, we're going to talk about proteas and uh, three major groups of proteas and what they are we'll go a little bit over the viral infections and replication and, and talk about some of the current issues with the coronavirus and the like uh, I don't know about you but I'm about coronavirus out understanding the concerns of certain able uh, certain viruses be able to cross boundaries to cause infection and that's kind of where we are and then we'll talk about uh, the HIV uh, example. So microbes, the most abundant organisms on the earth. Uh, the circulatory systems, the volume of amoeba, for example, is about a million billion or 10 to the 15th times smaller than that of a human. So at, at the size or force of gravity is trivial, so amoeba needs no skeleton uh, to support it. It's sort of a blob. Of material so a microbe refers to any of the different types of bacteria archaea and a uh, certain domain within the higher forms of life like yeast and that sort of thing there are fi viruses that uh, what we call bacteriophage viruses and these affect uh, bacteria uh, so I just make a general statement uh, viruses have infected every living type of organism on the planet and as far as I know, there's no viruses that infect viruses because I was asked that once. But um, I don't know of an example of that. But microbes uh, are pretty much everywhere. And um, I, that's kind of our discussion. Uh, microbe, of course, from the Greek origins, meaning small life. Uh, we've already talked about different types of bacteria and viruses in some introductory uh, chapters that we went over and uh, but what I'm after is some of the new things uh, that are pertinent uh, in our life and uh, uh, so it, there are domains of life we've talked about uh, bacteria archaea and eukarya which covers all the different forms and we're going to focus more, more on uh, the prokaryotic or the bacterial forms and microorganisms uh, microbes are grouped together because they're small I mean that's that's my training I trained as a bench microbiologist and that's 
uh, sort of my interest. Uh, they occur in three domains of life, including viruses which are not classified in any of the three domains because it, it's really almost like infectious genetic material uh, with a fancy uh, housing around it. I guess it's, it's, it's sort of one way to look at it. So uh, microbes are the most abundant organisms on the earth. They're smaller than the amoeba. The average bacterium in our can is about 10 to the 18th times smaller than a human. Uh, influenza virus is 10 to the 24th times smaller than a human. Now, I've, I, to be honest with you, I've never seen comparisons like that as far as how many times smaller. Uh, and so that's why I kind of threw in the uh, sort of the image here where we look at uh, one uh, millimeter versus uh, down to a micron and which is really really small and we're getting down there uh, to the nanoscale which you know uh, you're the generation of the nanoscale technology uh, amoebas uh, doesn't need a digestive system uh, it's the simplest form it just sort of grows around it or kind of encapsulated encapsulates it uh, and and then brings it in uh, but uh, that's kind of how most microbes are uh, they've been very successful I, I like to look at it as lean mean fighting machines uh, they're not wasteful they're uh, designed to do exactly what they need to do is to exist and if their existence happens to make you sick uh, you know they're not really there to make you sick they're there to grow and to uh, populate and to carry on and uh, that's what it is so here's E. coli in the gut we see that it, it provides uh, vitamin A and some other nutrients that we need to break down in our gut we have uh, a bacterium that lives at uh, geothermal pools. We've already talked about one that we use in polymerase chain reactions. Uh, bacillus uh, a species that uh, uh, Thermophilus uh, aquans, I believe it was. Um, and it grows in really hot, but chlorobiome does as well. Halobacteria grow in uh, really high salt environments, uh, like the Great, uh, great Salt lakes that we we have but they what the problem with that is of course these organisms have adapted to this high salt and it's it, uh, the osmosis that it would occur if a normal organism were to try to grow in this of course would uh, uh, zap all the water out of the organism and it would die quickly and so osmotic pressure would be huge uh, in these but these halobacteria have learned to grow in that but microbes are very genetically diverse. There's at least that we know of a half a million uh, different kinds of microbes. And we're sequencing and studying all of these more and more all the time. Uh, they are uh, in every habitat on the earth. They can eat almost anything. And, you know, just recently I read an article about bacteria that eat the plastic. And break down plastics into less toxic and uh, other types of plastic uh, intermediates that can be broken down by other bacteria so pretty much you know we have bacteria that can eat oil we call that bioremediation uh, these are types of organisms that break down things that uh, we normally are really concerned about in pollution uh, in um, our environment you know like those big uh, the Exxon Valdez uh, uh, catastrophe where we all that oil got into the ocean the water was a little bit too cold for bioremediation at the time but we've now adapted and engineered the organism to, to be able to do it but uh, we have microorganisms that can grow at the bottom of the oceans to uh, heat vents uh, quite amazing they're, they're everywhere total number of cells uh, in the human body uh, we've talked about that we have a hundred trillion cells and that's uh, that's a bunch, uh, yeah. And but microbe cells that live on you uh, are quite more numerous, and uh, that's rather a uh, huge amount uh, of microorganisms that we have. And uh, they live in your colon and armpits and feet and various things that we know about. And transiently too, we're learning because of PCR. 
the technology that we talked about in the lab, we're finding it in urine and blood and various things, very low amounts. At first, we used to consider those sterile, but we're actually finding microbes from time to time that uh, actually do uh, at, at spill into it. Microbes are small, as we know. They can live anywhere, and there's millions of different kinds of microbes on the Earth, enormous numbers. We know that. So the basic structure of a uh, microbe is sort of like a bathtub. It's all contained. Uh, the reason I say a bathtub, everything kind of floats in a milieu of, let's say, soapy water that we have. You know, when we're in a bathtub, you've got the rubber ducky floating around and various other things. But for them, their huge DNA, like a rubber band, it it's kind of twists up. And, but it, it's floating around. There's smaller pieces that confer antibiotic resistance and other things that make the organism or allow the organism to grow in areas that other ones can't called plasmids and uh, these are just extra extra chromosomal inheritance and then all the things that we've talked about with ribosomes and uh, the other types of nucleic acid uh, just the independent pieces that are in there and ATP and all those things and then uh, it's all contained sort of in a plasma membrane and a cell wall and then the outside we have a capsule. We have things that allow the microorganisms to attach to surfaces. We call those pili. Uh, they uh, can attach and cause disease and various things. They have these little whip-like structures called flagellum. They actually spin. And they're like little motor engines that propel the bacteria. And we call that chemotaxis. They move around. They can actually be attracted to a sugar or repelled by various things. And so they can spin the flagella in one direction or another to move it around. It's, it's amazing. Uh, they don't have a male or female or any of that. They just reproduce by binary fission. And every 20 minutes, boom, they uh, separate into two. And so they multiply exponentially that way. Think about that next time you leave your potato salad sitting out for a couple hours. Uh, they've had uh, many rounds of replication and contaminating it. Uh, and then you go to eat it and may have toxins or uh, more bacteria on there that could actually make you sick. So one way to look at bacteria is sort of that um, bathtub sort of analogy is sort of bags of enzymes. Bacteria is a simple structure. It's a cell envelope consisting of plasma membrane, usually cell wall, and maintains conditions inside that are different from the conditions outside and that's because of having that plasma membrane that uh, pr that acts as a barrier from outside to inside and then uh, it has a series of enzymatic activities and other things that allow it to move things in and out the dna or the, the big huge circular chromosome encodes for various activities one of which are things that can bring things in or out of the cell uh, they can be classified and usually are by their shape. They could be a, a coxy or sort of a uh, round or spherical type or bacillus or bacilli. Uh, other are s spiral shaped like spirilla. Uh, very interesting. We kind of refer to it sort of like a corkscrew. Borrelia burgdorferi, the causative agent for Lyme disease, uh, is a, a corkscrew like shape of an organism and uh, it's, it's nasty. Uh, it's usually vectored by a tick. And uh, uh, anyhow, we'll talk about that. Bacteria usually reproduce by binary fission, as I mentioned, and they double every generation, every about 20 minutes or so. And they vary, depends. There's some that grow faster, some that uh, that's, that's pretty fast at 20 minutes. Um, so they form, if you allow them to grow on a surface, in the old days, they used to culture bacteria by growing it on surfaces of sliced potatoes. This big, you know, baked potato type thing. But they don't cook it. They just slice it sterile on the inside and bacteria grow on it. And that's a little cumbersome. So we use uh, bacteria, um, what we use to grow them now is auger. And we use a petri plate, which is just a little round circular plate that's got, uh, oh, I don't know, half an inch. And we fill it up with this molten auger that has some sort of nutrient in it that the bacteria love and then it cools and then we can culture bacteria on the surface 
and then they grow and usually produce these little colonies. Now, usually they're sort of white, uh, grayish, but they can be colored and all sorts of different things depending on the media and stuff like that. So here's appearances on various plates as you can see and they can be dark depending on the type. Now as I, I was in a diagnostic laboratory and we used to put interesting chemicals in the plates to help us identify what they are and uh, what type of bacteria they are and it's usually how they grow and utilize uh, the materials that we put in the plate and then we have a detection scheme so they're a differential or they're uh, in a diagnostic way they help us to identify if they're breaking down a sugar or something like this here's a McConkie plate in the middle and the colonies turn red if it's E. coli as an example or uh, they may tar turn a dark uh, color like this if they're a certain type of organism it, it allows us to identify it and the true nature comes out this, this is how they react to various things in a very predictable way the other is that we used a gram stain the gram early on had no clue what was actually occurring but he just played with different dyes these stains that he used and what he was very good at was meticulously writing down everything that he did his recipes for making the various types of stains and then he would stain the bacteria and uh, then he would record what he saw and, and uh, under a microscope and today we still use in his name a, uh, a stain called the Gram stain and what it does is it really divides the universe of bacteria into gram positives gram negatives or ones that can't stain with the gram stain and those are usually your uh, mycoplasmas or ones that really don't fit the normal kind of classification they are weird tuberculosis organism doesn't uh, stain normally and they have a little bit of a different uh, life cycle so they they don't need to make uh, all the membrane uh, or the cell wall components like these organisms do the gram positives are purple and the gram negatives are pink and we still use this today and it helps us uh, begin therapy if you have a uh, infection with a different type of antibiotic because of the gram stain we now know uh, why the gram stain works the way it does it takes advantage of some differences in the cell wall that these have and uh, we can use that uh, with the stain which is really really cool and the colonies that form like I was mentioning on petri plates that's what these are that contain auger that has some sort of ingredient in the media and how they react to the media depends on the organism and the chemicals that are in there and we we can have selective plates or we can have differential plates the differential means that they use something in the media that differentiates them from other microbes maybe they turn red or they break down a component and turn the media a different color and that sort of thing but here's some just normal bacteria of various types from the environment just growing and you can see different colonies now if we were in the lab uh, one of the things i wanted you to do is go around sampling just random things it could be toilet seats or your phone which is worse than the toilet seat uh the drinking fountain that sort of stuff and you would get a a, a population of different microorganisms and you'd see them uh, these little round things are colonies and these are actually resulting from a single cell that grows and grows and grows and grows and so much that they start piling on each other and forms a colony. I know that sounds gross, but that's what it is and this is what we do. And so they're all clones, you know, that colony would contain clones of the initial bacteria that divided by binary fission and kept dividing, kept dividing, kept dividing and starts piling on and we see it as a colony. Now some of these colonies can get rather large some of them stay small and some of them are yellow white some of them are smooth some of them are shiny some of them uh, kind of look like little snow drifts uh, it's it's all about about the organism and their characteristic on how they are and it makes it really interesting yeah uh, so there's Hans Christian Graham the gentleman that came up with the the, uh, the staining technique and uh, to at his day he didn't understand what the gram stain that we call the day gram stain to honor him uh, but it that stain uh, 
he didn't understand what it was doing. Uh, he just observed that uh, some stained this purple and some stained the pink. And uh, it's quite interesting, but now we understand the differences like gram positives are colored purple by the stain because their cell walls have this really thick layer of the sugar protein. We call it a peptico, which is uh, amino acids and sugar, glycan. So it's a string of amino acids and sugar and it binds to it, but it's packed kind of thick and the uh, crystal violet dye that he used in his staining would, would sort of get stuck in it and it would stay stuck after the treatment of iodine. Now why he chose iodine and did all that, that's the magic of what he did. And we now know that the iodine is a mordant. In other words, it kind of gets the, the crystal violet jammed into that membrane. And then we use an alcohol to kind of clear this, clean the stain off if we can. And they're wedged in there, the crystal violet's wedged in there so good that even the alcohol doesn't remove it because the uh, crystal violet and the iodine kind of keep it in there. Where the other bacteria, the gram negatives, they lose it. And so the crystal violet, that dark purple color, is washed away. And then we come back with a, a, a secondary stain. And this stain uh, is, is pinkish in color. And because the purple is so dark, it masks the pink color. So we don't worry about the gram positive. But the gram negatives, we call it a counter stain because all the stain was washed away in the gram negatives. And then the counter stain would stain it this pinkish color. And that's the gram negative and it's a clever system we still use it today and it, it just blows my mind that this gentleman was able to do this and, and not really understand what was going on the complexity of it all but it's amazing uh, that uh, it, it still exists and so here's a good slide with the gram positives and gram negatives kind of mixed all over uh, we have a bacillus we have some uh, coxy arrangements there that are gram positives and we could see some gram negatives and uh, so anyhow it's very useful and we use it for diagnostic purposes and um, and the idea is the whole basis of microbiology now is propagating these growing them and we use it scientifically so we can grow them classify them and characterize the different bacteria and we've learned to do that but what we try not to do is to have a contaminant on a plate if you uh, you want a pure culture, you uh, practice a technology that uh, today we, we teach in the labs is, is sterile technique. And what you want to do is to minimize the risk of getting your plate contaminated. And, you know, things in the air and things fly off your body and you sneeze and all that stuff. We don't want any of that on the plate, so we want to keep a sort of a sterile environment around them. And every now and then, it's not a perfect technique, but it's it's... Uh, practical and every now and then a contaminant might find its way onto a plate now that's not good means that your technique might have been a little flappy there uh, but uh, thank God that uh, one gentleman uh, found uh, this uh, contaminant on his plate called penicillin now all it is is a bread mold and it grew uh, but he could have just Alexander Fleming could have easily just said, um, I, I, that never happened. We never saw the contaminant. But what he observed was this, this colonies of, of this, this material that was growing on the plate with this other bacteria, they had these zones that were nothing would grow anywhere near that penicillin or the, the bread mold. And he said, hmm, I wonder what is, is, is being produced by this bread mold that's essentially killing these other bacteria and won't allow them to grow. And make a long story short, uh, the active agent out of the bread mold uh, was isolated. We call it penicillin. And I cannot tell you how many millions of people this man, Alexander Fleming, saved their lives because of this very basic observation it's just it's one of those things in, in in science that it's an event that occurred that sparked this whole use of antibiotics and penicillin is one of the first ones to uh, be used to uh, save lives if people get a disease uh, gonorrhea for example uh, it was uh, pretty prevalent it uh, eventually causes us some of the hideous types of damages and and blindness and various things and we don't really want to get gonorrhea um, 
we we get gonorrhea from various uh, is a type of microorganism, and penicillin will kill it. And so, if uh, you were to acquire this sexually transmitted disease, then you could be treated with penicillin and get rid of it. And uh, see, that's just one of many things that penicillin would cure and get rid of for you. Uh, Dorothy Hodgkin came up with you know I you know me I'm into uh, structures of various things and I love models and models are a way to convey what's going on and how they work and and she developed this model now if you think about this um, she developed this way way back in the early 1900s and uh, it was her structure of the penicillin molecule and uh, it's amazing that um, that she was able to do this at the time frame and look at the the drawings that she had created around it to show you sort of here's the uh, the atomic structure of the atom was a part of that particular penicillin structure and of course it took up space because of it we all talked about the uh, octet rule and various things and we had these things kind of the electrons flying around so it kind of took up a space of influence and instead of kind of building it into the model she had drawn it in sort of in the space behind it so you could see it taking up that and that's what I try to do now when I 3d print it includes this in a 3d sort of environment anyhow uh, it still is it's all about models and understanding the structure which would allow a chemist now to take this structure and modify it to get even more different types of forms of penicillin that could be used uh, as uh, alternatives. We have noticed that bacteria, even in those days, would eventually become resistant to penicillin. So what they did is they made derivatives of these penicillin by making changes, and that's why the structure uh, is so important, to know the structure so we can modify the structure. And we get these cephalosporins that came out as a result of that, which is a penicillin derivative and that again saved lives and we were able to get even more antibiotics out there for treatments and uh, one of such of these derivatives was called ampicillin i'm sure you've heard of it developed in 1961 and it had a broader spectrum of activity and then we had second third fourth fifth generations of, of uh, like methicillin dioxacillin all these that go on and we found that certain organisms like uh, Staph aureus, which is now a real problem, a methicillin resistant uh, Staph aureus, and we have derivatives now, well, we used to have derivatives that were effective against MRSA. Uh, it's a strain that this grows and it, it's really hard to stop it, and um, it could be life threatening and it usually is, but we used to have antibiotics to treat it. Well, we don't anymore and we, we have to resort to multiple uh, types of antibiotics given at the same time and other types of strategies and we're still trying to come up with uh, yet other derivatives and one of which was a real famous one carbapenem and it was our last chance type of antibiotic it was known to stop pretty much anything that when we came down to it, it was sort of a last resort and now we found well in, in India uh, we found resistance uh, forms of everything in India back about, oh, I don't know, nine, ten years ago. And now we, we have nothing to stop uh, a major infection. Uh, all the antibiotics are sort of uh, becoming that way. So it used to be that carbapenem was effective, and now we're seeing that the carbapenems uh, are no longer working, meropenem and all these others. Um, aren't working like they used to and that's a real problem to give you a good example um, clostridium uh, uh, deficit that can cause uh, a uh, explosive type of diarrhea it's life-threatening it's usually uh, after a patient has undergone therapy like tetracycline to get rid of some other organism that's causing uh, life-threatening disease uh, this particular organism doesn't uh, seem to be affected by tetracycline and it'll start to grow. In fact, it kind of helps it grow because there's no other, no other organism to compete with. And these grow to get really bad and you have to treat it now with a different type. 
and this is called a CRE or a carbapentum resistant enterobacteriaceae, which is a mouthful, but it's just bacteria that grows in, a, in the in a digestive system and the car, carbapentum resistant. Well, a C. diff is uh, really, really bad. We see this a lot in the elderly, but it's explosive type of diarrhea. And uh, the problem is you can't properly absorb uh, water and you run the risk of dehydration and uh, gets in the blood and it's, it's just awful. It, uh, it's a terrible disease. Uh, so uh, bacteria that become resistant or CRE resistant uh, are really, really problematic. And the CRE gonorrhea, uh, sexually transmitted disease, and uh, we're finding it's resistant now to most of the drugs we used to use. And so uh, Nasir gonorrhea or gonorrhea this is the disease. Uh, now there is a form in Nasiria that uh, is actually in the age group that uh, most make up our classes that we teach at Wake Tech. Uh, in a lot of shared uh, environments, uh, bathrooms and the like, in dormitories, uh, students uh, might be experiencing a headache. And uh, there's a, a Nasiria meningitidis uh, that causes uh, sort of an infection in uh, around the brain and the symptoms of first appear as sort of a headache and it's unresolved it's usually a pretty strong headache and you feel a little tired and shaky and that sort of thing you you uh you don't want to uh underestimate that one you go see a doctor you go to the uh dispensary or whatever they call them now at at the schools you got to see a doctor um, because left for three or four days uh it could be life-threatening so if you have uh, a dormitory environment and you're sharing and that sort of thing and you do develop a headache and that sort of thing, it, it, it could be just acquired from the environment, uh, sharing a drink or something from someone, uh, you, you pick this organism up. It's just something to be aware of. Uh, don't let a symptom like that, especially at your age group, uh, go on because it's, it's pretty well identified as, as a, a real threat. So we have a series of these organisms that are out there in our environments um, that are highly resistant to various antibiotics. Canada, albicans, it grows in our mouth. Uh, the AIDS patients get this one, it, it, the thrush and that sort of stuff. Uh, Campylobacter jejuni causes, <coughs> excuse me, uh, diarrhea. We see all sorts of different types of uh, ones that grow in the uh, intestinal tract that are resistant to uh, beta-lactamase uh, producing type that are broad spectrum uh, different antibiotics. Vancomycin used to be one that we would treat um, for various different types and now we see vanco resistant uh, enterococcus species. Pseudomonas originosa we see this with burn patients. Uh, it leaves a it's sort of a greenish organism grows and it actually leaves green color and bandages. It has a sicky, sweet smell. It's really kind of nasty, but we're, it's resistant now, multiple uh, drug resistant. Salmonella, uh, it's a distant cousin of E. coli, and it's all sorts of types of uh, food poisoning. If you get uh, sick after six, seven hours after eating something, and you start vomiting and uh, have diarrhea that's kind of bloody, uh, salmonella is uh, suspect. Uh, you want to go to an emergency room, a 24-hour place, uh, and get treated for it because it can be very serious. Uh, Shigella causes the uh, same kind of uh, Shigella flexneri. It causes uh, uh, diarrhea. Um, MRSA, we see these in retirement homes, but you, yeah, anyone can get it. Uh, we can get it on the skin. It's usually an immunocompromised or folks with immune systems that are weakened, but uh, unfortunately it's methicillin. There's, they, they threatened to change the name or the meaning to multiple resistant staph, but still, it's just methicillin. Uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae causes pneumonia. It's a bad form. Uh, it's drug resistant and it's a big scare. One of the most uh, transmissible diseases, tuberculosis, bacterial disease, uh, is drug resistant. So it's a problem and it's used primarily due to an overuse of antibiotics, unfortunately. Uh, the veterinary profession uh, utilized antibiotics to treat animals as growth promoters. So they're not fighting infections, they would put uh, antibiotics in their feed 
and see the FDA and the USDA are two total different government agencies and the USDA regulated a lot of the things that went on with animals and the FDA kind of the human the Food and Drug Administration so the uh, acceptance or approval process for the FDA is a lot longer than USDA so a lot of times some of the new antibiotics that are coming out actually come out on the animal side first and if they're using them for uh, growth promoters and things like that and feeds and things we actually see those types of antibiotics in our environment and the bacteria learn to kind of get resistant to it and by the time we get it as a treatment well it's not very effective and that's we've known about that for a long time that we just kind of did it and so uh, staph, MRSA, and various different other ones, the tuberculosis, uh, really serious. It's, it's a uh, health threat. Robert Koch, uh, he identified a way uh, to reproduce the disease. Now, I, I, I did a research uh, in a uh, disease that actually was in children. Now, I didn't study it in children, of course. I studied a similar disease in uh, birds, and it's called femur head necrosis. And uh, it's usually caused by a staph, but I found that E. coli could cause uh, femur head necrosis and invasive disease in birds, and also happened in children. And so I used Robert Koch's uh, definition of how to reproduce a disease. And he did, he did this, if, you know, you, you uh, isolate the causative agent from uh, some, some animal that's died, you culture it in pure culture, you reintroduce it to a susceptible host again the same sort of let's say it was a pig or whatever if the pig now succumbed to the infectious disease from that particular bacteria that you grew pure culture and then able to re-isolate it again in pure culture then uh, Robert Koch would say mm, that's probably the causative agent and that was became sort of the standard now uh, in medicine if you want to say that something causes disease uh, use Koch's postulates to do that. Anyhow, tuberculosis is the second most common cause of death from infectious disease after, of course, HIV um, takes out your immune system. So, see, the, it's the spread. So, tuberculosis and influenza became sort of the uh, ones that kind of spread and kind of spread easily. And uh, the transmissibility is quite, rather high and uh, having tuberculosis is really really bad and it's uh, very deadly as as with the viruses that cause a respiratory type of disease as we know uh, and so tuberculosis is highly contagious and it can be transmitted uh, person to person coughs sneezes and that sort of thing which we all know about now uh, it's highly infectious uh, they told us when i was in school uh, infectious diseases that uh, that one was stomped out uh, it's no longer a problem, but no, it's still around with us today, and so tuberculosis can establish pretty uh, normal things. And if you look, it is a respiratory type pathogen, a dry cough, weight loss, fevers, weakness, sounds familiar, gastrointestinal symptoms, you know, um, now pretty scary stuff, and then we don't have anything really now to stop it. Uh, it's it's pretty bad, but um, so this is bacterial. This is not viral. Tuberculosis is uh, caused by a, uh, a, cost, uh, a uh, tuberculosis uh, uh, infectious disease agent, and um, so anyhow. So bacteria are efficient single-celled organisms uh, enveloped uh, a surrounding cytoplasm. Bacteria have no nucleus, is the way we define it, with in that organelle that has that double membrane that contains the nuclear material and the linear DNA. Bacteria don't have that. It has one huge circular piece, that big rubber band that's sort of in the uh, milieu or the, the protoplasm or the, uh, inside the, the, the bacteria cell itself, plasmids and various other things, and uh, it's sort of all existing. So uh, it's uh, genetic information we do call it a chromosome but it's circular and then smaller pieces of that are called nucleic acid so here's every uh, 20 uh, minutes or so we have bacteria down dividing and you can see the numbers just pretend that's sitting on your potato salad right now and it, uh, it's an organism that's growing and growing and growing 
and before you know it, it's uh, changed the uh, smell and characteristics of, let's say, that uh, potato salad, and you eat it, and you get sick, and so, anyhow, uh, not to make you paranoid, but that's uh, what's going on. Uh, bacteria divide, but they also have ways to share the genetic material, aren't they nice? So they, you know, they can go and share their genes, and uh, other bacteria can try on the genes. <laughs> Um, it's a stupid analogy, but uh, the, the DNA can be uh, shared. And we can do this, uh, you know, as bacteria divide. You can see uh, how they divide and separate, as we already talked about with binary fission. And they just simply divide. And what they do is they sort of attach to the membrane. And then the attachment areas of the membrane are sort of moved into two separate daughter cells. And that's it. Uh, there's no uh, female or male or any of that. It's just boom, divides. But the way they transfer genetic material, there's three different ways that we're aware of. Um, we can have viruses that uh, move it. We call that transduction. Bacteriophages uh, can move the genetic material. Their DNA could just be in the environment. And there's certain things you can do to actually get the DNA to go inside the cell. And you can change salt concentrations and various things. To change the permeability of the uh, membrane and get in there but we can transform them uh, this is just dna and it takes it in or you can have bacteria conjugate and they have these little structures um, uh, pili that can go from one organism to another sort of like a straw and the genetic material will transfer through it now that's not for sexual uh, replication it's just transferring or sharing some genetic information so those are the three different types and it, it essentially goes through uh, a rather a series of events but um, the bacteria in transduction is just a bacteriophage and when it attaches it sort of inserts itself sort of like a syringe and the genetic material gets inside the bacteria conjugation as i mentioned it can be sort of like transmitting through a straw and the genetic material can transfer and give and confer things like plasmids and other characteristics to a bacteria cell that might be uh, useful so you can see the conjugation there going on uh, sometimes pieces of chromosomes can transfer but it's uh, going from dissimilar type of organisms so for an example there's an e coli that causes a really nasty traveler's diarrhea but if you look at the sequences, it, it got them from Shigella flexni, a different organism uh, altogether. And so Shigella genes got into E. coli genes, uh, usually by this sort of method. Could be uh, through viruses too. Uh, transforming DNA is you just can have DNA sequences in the environment. And the confident cell, in other words, the membrane is such that it can take in that DNA and uh, acquire the, the genes. And we usually refer to uh, these three uh, together as a lateral gene transfer. In other words, it can change genetic information either through conjugation, through viruses, uh, we call transduction or transformation by just having the DNA in the environment. And uh, that's pretty much all I really want you to, to know about that. So bacteria undergo binary fission Bacteria genes are efficiently organized into groups. Um, virtually all DNA codes for proteins. Bacteria sometimes carry genes for specialized traits, like uh, antibiotic resistance and that sort of thing. Um, and DNA can be transferred laterally between bacteria cells for transduction, transformation, and uh, that uh, conjugation. So. Uh, bacteria can metabolize almost anything, and we're finding more and more things. Uh, we even found bacteria that can break down radioactive materials. Uh, it's amazing. Some bacteria can use light uh, and have photosynthesis. Uh, so there are specific type of bacteria we call trophic that uh, based on kind of their metabolic specialization, like chemo-organotrophs that feed on organic molecules. So they feed on chemicals and organic. Troph means that it has a ability to grow using chemicals or organic material. So it's organic uh, chemicals. Uh, chemolithotrophs feed on inorganic. So these are 
organisms able to grow on uh, inorganic chemicals and then using energy from sunlight uh, these are troughs that can produce their own energy auto using light and that's uh, those different uh, types of bacteria and we uh, we know and still have those around the oxygen revolution cyanobacteria resemble the first photosynthetic organism it appeared uh, before I was born about 2.6 billion years ago uh, able to use solar energy to build organic compounds so they were able to photosynthesize and then they would uh, as, as we know part of photosynthesis is it uh, ex exports O2 which is oxygen takes in CO2 uh, and so uh, these help change the Earth's atmosphere so this is what I was referring to as changing globally uh, and, and uh, adding oxygen which was not much at the beginning uh, of time but it's much higher now thank God because we're here we can we can breathe the oxygen aerobic bacteria require oxygen for growth anaerobic bacteria don't so they don't have to have oxygen there's um, these different types of organisms some bacteria are facultative anaerobes which can switch from either one which um, E. coli is, is one of those organisms that can do that, or Escherichia coli, I already mentioned, that distant cousin of Salmonella. So some bacteria can eat or organic materials, um, some eat minerals, others can carry out photosynthesis. And this occurred, uh, these organisms that uh, were photosynthesizing about 2.6 billion years ago, and literally changed the Earth's planet uh, environment, and so, which is a good thing. Many bacteria are beneficial. We need to have certain type of bacteria. Uh, these probiotic bacteria are really, really important. You get probiotics from pretty much any drugstore, various places. Um, the healthy, uh, there's several different organisms, acidophilus that, that help or are beneficial. Bifidiobacteria that are beneficial. There's all sorts of ones. But the thing is that we normally have these organisms when we're born and they help uh, throughout life help us digest and keep bad organisms from getting in our gut like that clostridium difficile and things like that but uh, you know we undergo antibiotic treatments and things that throws our flora or the natural bacteria off and so we need to supplement them and add them back and you can see she's eating yogurt and that helps bring back that normal flora um, and that, that keeps that balance of good health so uh, disease causing bacteria must colonize your body before it can make you sick but if it's already covered with these probiotic bacteria uh, most likely not going to happen um, so we can have enough of these good bacteria lining our gut then when the bad ones uh, we encounter they can't park there and they move on and that's a good thing so there are bacteria um, thriving in our offices, on our desks, uh, on our cell phone surfaces, on the uh, keyboards, and uh, really, really nasty. And so someone said, gee, you know, let's prove this scientifically. And they went around in various cities like New York and San Francisco sampling. And what they found were average number of bacteria colonies per sample, which is really nasty and just looking at various surfaces in New York and San Francisco in those uh, towns with various things where people are uh, and they took in samples and plated them and see what was growing and we found huge numbers of bacteria and women's deaths and men's deaths and if I were to sample your cell phone surfaces right now it probably there be things on there that would take me days to try to identify. I'm sure they would not be nice. Um, so they're, they're actually dirtier than toilet seats, is what I've found on my own. Uh, the abundance of bacteria are everywhere, in office buildings and, and the like. Uh, as we already discussed, pathogenic bacteria can cause all sorts of diseases. And we uh, have found that uh, they can be communicated through water and various things. And we can actually track infections spreading through water systems and the like. And cholera was, a vibro cholera is an organism that causes a really nasty type of disease. 
and uh, it, we found and tracked it through um, uh, the water systems. There are fresh, uh, flesh-eating bacteria uh, called necrotizing fasciitis. I wrote a case study on it. Uh, fasciitis is really, really nasty. You can go swimming in some of these just little kind of uh, small lakes or, uh, uh, or ponds and you can get an infection just you know you may have a nick or something on your skin and the next thing you know um, a surgeon's uh, been called to cut out some of your infection on your skin it can be that bad it's really really ugly uh, type of disease and cholera and various other types of bacteria uh, we know that streptococcus pyogenes causes a strep throat and even even uh, strep throat, you know, the streptococcus fasciitis, which causes uh, the flesh-eating bacteria that I was referring to, streptococcus species and pyogenes causes this uh, uh, strep throat. And uh, we found that it's actually producing toxins now that can cause uh, paralysis uh, of hands and feet and that sort of thing from a simple strep throat in children. So um, some of these diseases that we used to think were, okay, we can treat the strep throat are getting a little bit more serious and you need to know about that. Um, anyhow, we can uh, treat these diseases. We have to identify them first uh, and we usually treat them with antibiotics as best we can, but right now we seem to be finding that a lot of these organisms are resistant, which is a really bad thing. The other are sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, they're on the upswing. A lot of these uh, uh, social sites where you can get uh, a friend or meet somebody and anonymously, and then you can have these little um, trysts and last. And the problem is that some of those uh, is a great way to propagate sexually transmitted diseases. And uh, we're seeing uh, an upswing in these, and uh, it's quite disturbing. And I think some of these social sites are, are actually helping to propagate these types of infections. And these have been around for a long time. But again, in the background of the fact that uh, we don't have antibiotics to treat them, um, it is a pressing public health issue. These STDs are uh, spreading uh, really like wildfire and it's, it's really kind of um, uh, hard to treat. So the most common STDs out there we have the bacteria type the gonorrhea, syphilis, treponema pallidum, chlamydia infections uh, cause all sorts of uh, pretty uh, disturbing uh, um, symptoms. Uh, of course viruses are AIDS and herpes and Papilloma viruses are really, really nasty, and um, they're hard to get rid of. Uh, trichomatis uh, have a protease, uh, have a trichomonas infection, uh, painful urination, and various things. Uh, we have to have a certain type of drug against the uh, trichinoma type of infection. Yeast infections, uh, again, there's only three typically antifungals that we treat folks with and unfortunately we're seeing resistance in those as well and uh, yeast are really hard to treat sometimes and crab lice and various things um, bed lice you know we're hearing about those and they're hard to treat boy it just sounds like hmm, things are bad but it's we've known about it it's just kind of gotten worse over the years and we just need to be aware knowledge is an important way to kind of combat that and if you know about it, then hey, you know, less likely you're to have to, to go through something like that. Microbes compete for resources, uh, rapid growth rates. They have to acquire nutrients even if they're growing in you. Um, and they have chemical defenses. They actually produce chemicals that are toxic or can cause cancers for that uh, matter. So we, we have to be careful and get rid of these things. Um, and where we get a lot of these antibiotics, by the way, as you notice, it was bread mold and, you know, yeast. But there are other bacteria that produce substances that we can use as antibiotics. So we're studying those, trying to find new classes of antibiotics and things like that to stop this kind of spread that we have right now. 
And of course, we just mentioned conjugation as a means of transferring genetic material. Well, it's increasing the antibiotic resistances across the board, and it's not helping. And so, uh, so the evolution of resistance, because bacteria grow every 20 minutes, uh, we can have a evolution um, pretty quickly. So you could have uh, a bacteria normally that's sensitive, but let's say you were taking an, an antibiotic for some disease and, and you said, gee, you know, I'm feeling better now. I don't need to take the rest of the bottle of this stuff. Uh, you know, it kind of makes me feel kind of groggy anyhow. So I'm just going to stop taking it. Well, what happens is that we don't kill and clear all those organisms. Now we get some spontaneously that are resistant to that particular antibiotic and it starts to grow. And then let's say you say, Doc, you know, I, I, this stupid disease has come back. Well, he can't treat you with that antibiotic anymore because it's resistant. And the next thing you know, uh, you've got uh, an infection that uh, we have to switch antibiotics or hopefully and uh, treat it. But as I mentioned before, antibiotics have been used as a growth promoter or ways to en enhance, make more money uh, from animals because they're bigger and that sort of thing. And we use the antibiotics in agriculture, usually as growth promoters or just enhances the uh, outcome. So antibiotic resistance is really a real problem. It could be done through plasmids and transferring genetic information from organism to organism. And so we're starting to see this highly resistant uh, level of bacteria in, in every form. And what, one of the things we know is contributing to it is the excess use in agricultural and farm animals and the like. Uh, archaea are hugely different uh, from bacteria. Archaea just means sort of, you know, like your professor, he's archaic, you know, he's old. And archaea just means uh, the older forms. And uh, they, they metabolically are different. And I don't usually study them because they're not pathogens, so I don't really have much interest in studying them but uh, they do look like bacteria but they are different so archaea possess characteristics that place them between bacteria and eukaryotes the higher forms archaea and bacteria may look similar but their sequences and how they grow and all that are different um, neither archaea nor bacteria have distinct cell nucleus so they're more like prokaryote which is the uh, simple bacteria forms archaea are extreme files in other words they're old and the planet was really nasty environment. It was really cold or very hot. And um, so these organisms kind of proliferated in those years. And we call them extreme phobes, uh, files, I mean. And so they could grow in those environments and they persisted. And they're still around today, but they are. Uh, I mentioned bioremediation. And a lot of times these microorganisms, we can use the archaea to break down the oils case of oil spills and things like that and so we can do that we we've learned to use uh, thermophilus aquaticus for um, a pcr technique and other organisms uh, using the dna polymerase from those organisms growing in those in very hot environments and have uh, applications that allow us to do stuff um, intestinal archaea can help you digest some chemical bonds and beans and things like that um, usually produce all sorts of gas and things like that that we know about. So uh, archaea can tolerate extreme physical chemical conditions. Archaea are uh, hard to study because many require extreme heat uh, to grow. Ability of archaea to thrive in extreme conditions make them potentially valuable for industrial or environmental types of applications. And so we do use them for that. Uh, the first eukary uh, eukaryotes were protease. These were the early forms of life, and they they had the, sim the 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 characteristics of the higher forms of life. And some of the early protease took on bacteria symbionts like mitochondria, where they incorporated into our genome. Uh, so the mitochondria actually uh, we've already talked about our uh, the DNA and their. Um, uh, ribosomal RNA are similar to the prokaryotic or the bacteria, not like ours. So we know 
uh, they are symbiotic from other forms of life that's kind of co-migrated with ours and we call this endosymbiosis and again this is not new we've talked about that so nucleus is evolutionary innovation that appears the first time in proteins and they took on uh, took in bacteria cells that subsequently became uh, mitochondria or in um, uh, plants it was of course the organelle that's responsible for capturing sunlight energy and so uh, we adapted pretty interesting uh, the protease small animal like fungi and plant like protease uh, are more um, uh, higher forms of life uh, they're modal they appear to uh, hunt for prey they're ciliates because they they have ways to propel themselves uh, but they're they are interesting they are different they are transitional type forms of fungi like uh, uh, protease they're uh, heterotrophic in other words uh, they have to go out uh, and produce uh, uh, their own uh, acquire from the environment they resemble the fungi and they form sheet like colonies or cells that's uh, that use spores to reproduce the slime mold so I can see them on bacteria plates sometimes trying to grow on them and they have a totally different form and look plant like protease they grow in water and they use photosynthesis and they resemble plants algae and seaweeds and various things and a lot of these are eaten by sea life and acquired uh, like phytoplankton and uh, things like that and some of these really large fish feed on those and they get enough food from those uh, to, to grow so proteins are a diverse group of unicellular uh, eukaryotic organisms ciliates the ones that have the hairs around them like paramecium or animal like protease slime molds are like fungal like organisms uh, colony forming type protease multicellular protease like giant kelp can be enormous in plant-like appearance so uh, they they're interesting uh, some proteins can make you very sick uh, like plasmodium vivax and those can affect your blood and cause red blood cells to crenate and having those types of uh, uh, infectious diseases uh, you, you have to have uh, be treated with uh, the material or the chemical that they're talking about now that they're using for the or thinking about using for the virus uh, actually treats uh, the malaria uh, with plasmonium vivax and that sort of thing so some pro proteins cause uh, debilitating diseases like plasmonium uh, responsible for malaria and uh, it has characteristics that uh, protect it from the human Im immune system so they've learned to to stay away from things that can try to clear it but unfortunately causes uh, disease viruses well unfortunately you know some of the effects of viruses uh, viruses can be DNA or RNA never both uh, the virus that we're being uh, attacked by right now is an RNA virus they can be enveloped or not enveloped uh, in other words this is part of the cell membrane when they butt off we'll talk about that and this is different so they refer to these non -en enveloped uh, viruses as nude viruses the basic shape of the virus that contains the nucleic acids of some kind is encoded or encapsulated by a capsid and so you can see that capsid or container around it and then if it's a enveloped virus it has glycoproteins and various things around it and it makes it uh, really nasty but the viruses by themselves cannot replicate they have to like a pirate uh, get their genetic material into your cells and have you do everything else to the point where their DNA comes in like a pirate takes over the system where it your cells essentially become manufacturing sites for the components pieces and parts of the viruses and uh, they lay waste uh, to those um, cells and meanwhile it's propagating those viruses now to spread and infect other cells and that's what's really nasty about these uh, so there are other forms of non-living infectious agents uh, worse than viruses in some ways the prions 
and uh, prions uh, are considered misfolded proteins and they're usually ingested from infected animal like eating uh, monkey brains or uh, you've heard of uh, Kutzfeldt Jacobs disease that's really bad uh, it uh, causes a sort of a slow uh, debilitating disease it causes damage to the brain and uh, before you know it uh, you lose your conscious uh, ability to do things and think and uh, you die from it mad cow disease it's really bad no known cure or treatment and pretty scary so uh, viruses are not alive and the reason they call it they're not alive because I say if you can kill it with Clorox and it was alive right uh, they don't replicate on their own and that's one of the criteria that we call alive what they do is that they transmit their genetic material and as a pirate take over your ship or your cells and then uh, it now engineers itself to make more of it and you're sort of at the beck and call uh, the types of diseases that uh, we've influenza, HIV, common cold, herpes. Um, we can develop uh, vaccines. The virus that we're under being under siege right now, coronavirus, uh, is one that can mutate rapidly because it's an RNA virus. RNA viruses, of course, are not DNA. They don't have double strands and single strands. So if they get a mutation, there's no way to repair it, and so they, they mutate, uh, uh, or we would repair it, the viruses don't. And um, so they pretty much uh, transmit pandemics or worldwide epidemics. I don't think I need to go through uh, details of this. I think everyone is well informed about what's going on. But uh, this has happened every 100 years or so. About 100 years ago, we had the influenza pandemic and it laid uh, havoc um, and the swine flu uh, we saw in the 70s uh, SARS uh, which is the severe acute respiratory syndrome we saw in about 2002 and we're about equivalent to, with this virus I think with SARS in fact it's SARS-2 it's a very similar uh, but it seems to affect more of the lower respiratory where the, uh, the SARS affected uh, the upper respiratory as did the influenza virus but uh, viruses are nasty and they they can spread through the air as we know and um, many diseases are caused by viruses DNA viruses are relatively stable because DNA replicating enzymes check for errors where RNA viruses change quickly and that's what's scary about the one that we're dealing with right now um, and there's no way to really correct it glycoproteins on the surfaces of viruses uh, really are how they know what cells are cells to attach to so they, they have riggings or special attachment features that allow these pirates to kind of gain entry to certain types of cells to take them over so respiratory cells is a good example now and um, so each different type of viruses have the different types of mechanisms to attach so they call this tissue trophism or specificity for a particular tissue and each uh, virus sort of has a unique characteristic encoded in it. Unfortunately, sometimes viruses can be transmitted what they call species jumping. So sometimes viruses only affect certain types of animals and so uh, they become zoonotic. In other words, that term is special because it goes from one animal species to another. So it can go from like pig to human. It's now become zoonotic. And it's acquired some characteristics that allow it to now bind to our cells, to become pirates for our cells. And that's what they mean by uh, species jumping. And uh, unfortunately, we're living an example of that right now. So glycoproteins on the surface, glyco, remember, sugar, uh, proteins on the surfaces of viruses determine the types. You may have heard N1H1, okay, neuraminidase and uh, hyaluronidase are the two types of uh, uh, materials that hang on the surfaces of these viruses that use as a mechanism to attach to uh, our cells. Most viruses can affect just one species, but sometimes they can jump species because of genetic changes that occur. 
HIV uh, illustrates uh, an example where it spread. I remember when it was first found uh, in the 70s, the late 60s, early 70s, and didn't understand what was going on. And it was acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, uh, but it, in those days it was not understood and it was pretty scary. Uh, I was in school at the time and uh, we were worried that it was going to be transmitted through mosquitoes or things like that. It turned out not to be the case, but HIV even so was uh, very difficult to uh, treat. And, um, it is a virus that kind of uh, was anti, if you remember, the central dogma theory. We have DNA to RNA to a protein. Well, this organism or this virus has the ability to force, as being a pirate, the host cell to make an enzyme which gets packaged with this virus called reverse transcriptase. And this is just one now we're seeing others, viruses that are similar to this. They can convert now the RNA to DNA, and then the DNA is incorporated into your genome. And uh, reverse transcriptase is there, and it's error prone, uh, so it mutates. Now, you can get the virus, HIV virus, but you do not have AIDS. And what happens, and this is what's hideous, nasty about HIV, is that it can mutate and then infect a type of immune cell called a T helper cell, which is the cell that really regulates or controls the communication amongst all the other cells, takes it out, and essentially now you become a, a living organism that has no immune system. And you can imagine the havoc that that uh, causes. Uh, you essentially can no longer fight anything, and you get thrush or that, that different organisms growing in your throat, and it just you usually get carposis sarcomas, because most people don't understand that the immune system also helps us fight cancers, and they stop early forms of cancers. And so, having a healthy immune system is really, really important for lots of reasons for protecting you from invaders, but also to stomp out early cancers or tumors that might form and get rid of them. And unfortunately, uh, HIV, once it becomes AIDS, and it mutates. And it will mutate eventually, and when it does, one of the mutations that can cause it to become really nasty is its ability now to adhere to uh, T helper cells and then damage those cells and then uh, cause our immune system to collapse, and that's AIDS. So HIV attacks white blood cells and ultimately the immune system will collapse and the T helper cell is a key piece of, of that whole system. HIV is difficult to control. Mutations change the properties of this retrovirus so that it's hard for the immune system uh, to produce variants. And uh, so but we've come to the end. This is it. Now this will be the last presentation and uh, it's a very relevant one, as we found out. Uh, but uh, read through the, the book, and uh, hopefully this was helpful in uh, getting your understanding of uh, what's going on. And it's been my joy uh, to be your host. Unfortunately, uh, to take us through a, uh, a seated scenario to an online, but uh, you know, we're adaptable and we can, we can do anything. We put our minds to it. And, so an online scenario, ultimately, now guys, I'll tell you, and gals, uh, you don't need me. Uh, ultimately, you need to learn how to learn and to think, and eventually you can do all of these things without having an instructor to do it. Uh, so part of the education is, hopefully, that you've uh, been able to interpret uh, the material and apply it. And I work hard to make sure that I try to transition this material to something relevant into your lives, and that's what I've tried to do. So anyhow, I hope you've enjoyed it, and I've posted uh, some timelines for exam three and uh, getting into the final and lab practicals and all those sorts of things. And we're gonna just take one item at a time. Hopefully, um, I will do a voiceover for the lab practical study guide, which I posted. And uh, I've got, uh, some review materials for exam three for you and I'll post that and give you a chance to uh, ask some questions. Uh, we'll try to do a Teams-based uh, 
review if you want um, for that. If you don't, that's fine. I, I'll have a, a study guide for you as I already posted a study guide for the lab practical. And then the final exams, I've got to figure out how um, to let you study your old exams and then uh, with the new material that you have. You have the take-home exam for exam three, and that's due at the time. And so I've already posted when that timing is for the exam three. And, um, and so you've got some time to prepare for that. So next week we have the lab practical, and then the week after that. And we have also set aside time for the finals. So uh, it's pretty well, we, we finished up on, on, on time. We have a, a, a good amount of time for you to prep and kind of uh, get through it all. So I hope you've enjoyed and let's uh, get through the last bit of this and then we'll move on uh, to better and greater things uh, this summer and next semester uh, in the fall. Take care and be safe.